folks to also be my eyes and ears when you're out there on the forest and, and doing the things and popping concessionaires and, and the uh, people on the forest. I, I'm sure you get stopped every so often. Some of you probably get stopped ignoring me too often. But, but we are public servants, so that's our job, right? Um, okay, show of hands. How many people here go on hikes? There's a bunch of people that don't hike around here. No, oh, keep them up, keep them up, okay? So I want, I want to see, okay. All right, keep up high. Now, of those of you who go on hikes, how many of you put on insect repellent when you go on hikes? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. For those of you who don't, okay, put your hands down. For those of you who don't put on insect repellent, hopefully it'll maybe change your mind after the presentation today. Okay? Um, so let's start with the slides. All right, like that, and I, most of you, most of you have seen me before. Who hasn't seen me before? Okay, we got a few. Good. You're the people that this is really directed towards. For the other people, it's a lot of refresher. All right? Maybe a little bit of few new facts and things like that. It's refresher for a lot of you, but it's important refresher, and I'll tell you why. Um, we had somebody die from one of the diseases I'm going to mention. Uh, not here in man, but somebody in man would contracted it, but another person with a bogey tie. Uh, if you were here last year, you heard about it, I'm sure. Um, so my job is to go out. Um, and, and try to protect people from diseases transmitted by arthropods and animals to humans. Okay, next slide. And we do four main things. We do uh, prevention, education, and surveillance and control, uh, disease investigation, and then of course um, I do this other thing called compliance, uh, where I go and uh, review programs that apply pesticides uh, or Causing organisms. Like Owens Valley has a um, mosquito abatement, and Animal Place has a mosquito abatement program. And so I'm out there making sure that they're applying pesticides and proper. Next. Um, so, uh, what is a vector now? A vector is any organism, um, primarily insects, though, or arthropods, that's uh, capable of causing disease or transmitting a disease causing agent to a human. Next. Or animal. So different kinds of vectors that are found throughout the world. Um, I don't know about Antarctica, but just about everywhere else, you'll find some sort of vector. Yeah, there's some one on the bottom right. Bottom right, ah, good eye. That's a trichoma bug, Reduvid, okay? It's a kissing bug in some, some, some place we call it kissing bugs. It transmits childish disease, okay? On the eastern side of the Sierra, they're much more common, and they're probably fairly common down as you head down into Owens Valley area. You probably find them. In, and uh, actually, I'll talk a little bit later about that. I don't have slides for it. It's not one of the ones I'm really covering up here. But that's, that, yeah, that's, that's an interesting bug. We, we've only had one human case of Chagas that we think was actually acquired through the bug and not transfusion here in California that we know of. Uh, and there's reasons for that. Okay, and, 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 and yeah, some of the lots of antibiotics, mosquitoes, fleas, ticks, mice, um, sand flies. And he sees he flies, unfortunately, one of those. Nice. Um, and then, of course, animals can be vectors as well. Uh, rabies being uh, one of the vector diseases, but I don't really cover rabies. And, uh, of course, hompivirus by our friend of the earmops. Um, and you guys, as you can see, for those of you who, this is your first time uh, getting this presentation, I'm going to be a little stunned about hompivirus. Next. Um, so today, really, what I want to cover are the high-risk, what I call high-risk diseases, okay? The reality is, vector-borne diseases are rare, okay, in North America. Now, you go to Africa or South America or some of the lesser developed parts of the world, vector-borne diseases are common, and you will wear your repellent when you're there if you take any life from the CDC and travel. Um, so what I want to cover today is West Nile virus, plague, hantavirus, and then two tick-borne diseases, uh, one line, because uh, everybody wants me to cover a line, um, not because it's a huge risk here, and then uh, take more to some fever. Okay, next. Nice. So what's now virus? Um, I'm, I'm really lucky in some ways because I was involved with what's now virus at the very start. So, um, the normal transmission cycle for what's now virus is bird and mosquito. It's not just any mosquito, it's certain species of mosquitoes, okay? All right, just like there are um, many species of plants, there are many species of mosquitoes. We have over 50 here in California. 
not all of them feed on people. Thank goodness. Okay? And so really what humans and horses and other animals are incidental hosts. Right? We're kind of considered a dead end because we usually are unable to transmit it back to mosquitoes. Next. All right, so in 1999, I lived in New York City. In fact, I lived in Queens, in New York City. And uh, I had applied for a job at Bronx Zoo, didn't get the job, but they called me up a week later and said, the Centers for Disease Control are coming to look at the St. Louis encephalitis outbreak. The St. Louis encephalitis is a disease in the United States. We don't see a whole lot of it, but they're having this massive outbreak of it, what they thought, in New York City. I lived there, I didn't have a job, I was uh, between I was a seasonal person like some of you folks. And uh, I've just been doing Marvel Murelet surveys um, and spot owl surveys. And I went back to New York, applied for the job at the zoo. Yeah, they called me up and said, hey, the CDC's coming out to look at this um, problem uh, with St. Louis, and they need volunteers. Well, I'm not working. OK, I'll help them out. Um, that job led me finally to here, because it wasn't St. Louis encephalitis. It ended up being a small virus. So I've been involved with West now since day one. Next. And now I'm going to show you a series of progression slides that just show how fast that virus moved across. Right? Next. And next. And we got here in California. Really great. Now, the great thing about West Nile, the one good thing about it is it seems to be a, a kind of a warm weather disease. In other words, it takes a certain temperature for the virus to really circulate within the mosquito, replicate, and migrate to the salivary gland and then be infectious to a human. You're up here at Mammoth, you don't have a whole lot of high temperature degree days, okay? Your degree days, but you do get warm enough to actually have less amount of virus. It's probably a short window up here. It's going to be a lot longer down in Bishop and in the valley, okay? Um, but it's a shorter window up here. Next slide. And if you do get West Nile virus, chances are some of you here have already had it. Okay? Um, vast majority of people never know. Okay, asymptomatic, meaning you've been infected, your body fought the virus, no problem. And now you've got antibodies for it. Um, about one out of five people will develop what we call West Nile fever. Okay? And they are actually sick. And who knows why? You know, everybody's immune system is different. Okay? Um, a good friend of mine had it, he was not, and he's one of the healthiest people I know, I mean, triathlete type, okay? And it knocked him flat on his back for two weeks. Right, so it, it can be pretty serious. And then, uh, next slide. Very rarely is it fatal. Normally the fatalities happen in the elderly or immune compromised individuals, okay? So, um, but for those who aren't, um, Killed by it, and we're a little bit worse than the fever. We call it the central nervous system disease. Um, it's like polio. And people who, and very healthy people, have ended up like this. Um, they basically are crippled for life. Some of them are bedridden. And these were formerly productive people, they had great lives. You know? But guess what? They were outdoors, they didn't come. All right. And, and now they're in a hospital or in Next slide. Uh, I just wanted to show that you know we do get human infections early on in the year potentially. This is an older slide, but it shows you that we have all these different sentinel methods out here, and then we don't get the epi curve or the, the human cases usually until the large human cases usually until later in the year, July, August, September time frames. Next, next slide. Okay, what are the risk factors for what's not? Being outside at dawn and dusk, warm temperatures, <coughs> birds and mosquitoes. Well. You have all of those, right? <laughs> Pretty much. Um, what can you do to reduce the risk? I, I used to do some trapping up and divining on a regular basis for hauntlers, and I would find buckets with water because you know you've got the lawn being watered and the buckets standing upright or planters, and they got lots of water in them. And I often find the mosquito larvae in that water. So try to reduce. The water that's standing in and around the immediate area where you're living and working. That's one thing you can definitely do. Okay, each one. Um, and make sure you have screens on your windows. Okay, that's also helpful. They have holes in them. Catch them. Next. Okay. And of course, the best thing you can do is avoid being outside during the times that mosquitoes are out there, but you're forced to reason. You can't do that. Alright? There are a lot of different products now. It used to just be DEET. DEET was the only thing available for a long time. 
There's the carotene, there's the oil of lemon eucalyptus, and there's another one that's got a number name, I think, to it. I can't remember it offhand. All of those are effective. Deep works the best. And deep works the best also on other um, things like tick.